Good evening. I hope everyone is enjoying the COSI STEM Festival. Our team would like to thank everybody for the opportunity to participate in this year's events. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the debut of Guess Who, Ohio State's new STEM game show. My name is Jason Servanek, and I'll be serving as your host for this evening. I am not a professional, I am an amateur, so please bear with us. We have a few short announcements today to share before the program starts to ensure all attendees have the best experience possible. We're happy to be, happy to be able to provide American Sign Language interpreters and captioning for this event. These services were made possible with thanks to funds from Ohio State Energy Partners. In order not to interfere with the captioning, we've turned off the chat and instead we'll be using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to communicate throughout the program. So go ahead and find that button at the bottom of your screen now. For those attending by phone, what the presenter is, is uh, on the screen sharing the, with the interpreter will default to a small video in the corner. And to make the interpreter appear full screen, simply tap on that small video and it'll maximize it to the full size of the screen. For those attending by computer, be sure to select side-by-side -side view under the view options button. And this will allow the uh, visual to have access to the interpreter. And I will go ahead and post those instructions in the Q&A. So one of my colleagues is gonna go ahead and put that in there. So if you wanna have those instructions, you'll have them throughout the entire event. We do want you to participate tonight. So we will be having some polls. There will be fabulous prizes. Most of us have not been in our offices for about a year. So the best we could dig up in those boxes in the back of the closet was some free t-shirts. So if you play along, there'll be nine polls this evening. And at the end, we will choose the top vote or the top score or randomly select somebody from the top scores in order to receive a free t-shirt and we'll email you with the email address you will use to register this evening. Those polls will appear on the screen, so there's nothing you need to do, but there's also that Q&A button on the bottom. So if you have any technical support you need, feel free to use that and one of our team members will try to help you out. You can also use it to post questions tonight to help out our guessers. Our guessers are gonna be trying to match up the research areas for our grad students. So if you'd like to offer some whimsical or some serious questions, use that Q&A box. It should also allow you to upvote some of the questions. So if you have a question that shows up that you really want asked, please go ahead and upvote that. Uh, you're providing your own snacks, drinks, and restrooms this evening. So hopefully you remember where you place those. We would like to thank Ohio State Energy Partners for funding tonight's event um, and also the West Cut Fest Collaborative will introduce some of those people at the end that are helping make this possible and brainstorm this idea and brought it to fruition. So before we go over tonight's rules, we would like to make a, a land acknowledgement. If we were on the Ohio State University uh, campus, which is where all of us are based, we would like to acknowledge that, that that land has long served as a site of meetings and exchange among the indigenous peoples, specifically the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, and Delaware nations. We'd like to honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which we would be gathering. Okay, so for the rules for tonight's fast paced guess who game, there are two guessers who will be introduced in just a moment. And their job, and your job if you're playing along at home, is to match three contestants that we'll introduce with the research that they do. So you too can play along at home and help nudge these guessers in the right direction. There is a slide that's on the screen right now that shows you how this game works. We, we have two guessers, like I said, we'll introduce in a second. There are three contestants, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. They are all graduate students from The Ohio State University from a diverse range of research areas. We will be having three rounds tonight. And in each of those rounds, the researcher whose research is being featured, their topical area, will be honest in their answers. The other two researchers, have been told to lie. And in fact, they very well might know nothing about what the other person's research is. And so our guesses will be asking them questions to try to tease out who in the world does which each area, each area of research. And each of our contestants will be answering the questions, one of them honestly, and the other two will be answering dishonestly. Now, just because that is not enough fun, we've gone ahead and added some videos and some photographs to these challenges. So there'll be a photo of a piece of equipment that the researcher uses. We'll ask you to weigh in on what you think the purpose of that piece of equipment is, what it is, and also the cost of the equipment. And our guesses will also be trying to figure that out. And we'll also show you a scene that's really important for their research. 
and we'll ask them to explain why that seems important. And at the end of that round, we will ask you and our guesters to try to figure out who in the world is each researcher. Once again, you will get nine chances to play along, so we'll see who gets the high score. And hopefully everybody does well this evening. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our two guessers who have signed up for this guinea pig of an experience. So we'll start out with Lena Tenney. We'll bring her on screen and give her a few seconds to introduce herself and tell us who she is. Hi, my name is Lena Tenney. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am currently the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer in the College of Pharmacy at OSU. That's a, a newer role uh, coming out of the Kerwin Institute where I was doing anti-racism trainings. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. And the most important thing to know about me is that I love dapper fashion and cats. And there is a solid chance that Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Pergood Marshall or both will interrupt us at some point. So look forward to that as well. Thanks, Lena. And Ty Owen is our second guesser for this evening. So Ty, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, sure. My name's uh, Ty Owen. For about 10 years of my professional life, I spent as an informal science educator, primarily in the areas of technology and innovation, so robotics, 3D printing, uh, computer programming, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, I also put the A in STEAM as a Greater Columbus Arts Council artist. Uh, I'm currently a software developer and uh, musician here in Columbus. Awesome. Thank you. And so um, to make this game work, we have dug deep in the heart of Ohio State to find a range of researchers who could play along with us this evening. So I'd like to also bring our contestants up on the screen and allow them to introduce themselves. We have invited them to put a Zoom mask of their choice on if they would like. Um, we won't be disclosing a lot about them, but it wouldn't be a game show if we didn't allow them to share at least something about themselves. So contestant number one, I'll have you come up first. And I'd like you as you come up, to tell us the most exciting thing you've done over the last six months during this pandemic. Hi, I'm Chelsea. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania. I do not watch The Office, but that's probably what you thought when I said Scranton. Um, the most exciting thing I've done during the pandemic. Hmm. I guess this isn't exciting for me it is, but in the month of May, I ran over 200 miles all in support of uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Awesome. Thank you very much. Contestant number two. Hi, um, I'm contestant two. And the most exciting thing I did during the pandemic Last summer, I went on a long road trip um, to, I drove to Idaho. I had a friend that was doing a summer job in Idaho. So I road tripped out there and camped along the way and it was okay to camp, you know, during the pandemic. So it was, it was really fun to just get out of the house after being cooped up for a while. Good time to get outdoors. And contestant number three. Hey, I'm Zach. Um, and I'm going to have to agree that the most exciting thing I did was camping on, along the Mohican over, uh, over uh, I think, uh, late summer. So. Excellent. Okay, so it's after 8 p.m., so we are definitely not going to make this an essay or fill-in-the-blank style show. So we will be giving you multiple choice this evening just to make things a little easier because it would be pretty hard to guess what some of these researchers are doing. So to help you out along the way, we're gonna give you some topics. The first topic we have this evening is invasive species. The second is pharmacology. And the third is mycology. And if you need a flashback to Latin that you maybe didn't have in high school, that would involve fungi. So this will be a fast paced game. To make it more interesting, we're gonna do three rounds as I mentioned. We'll start out with invasive species, then we'll move on to pharmacology, and last but not least, mycology. Remember, during this invasive species round, our first round, only the invasive species contestant is being honest. The other two researchers are being dishonest. So here we go. We're gonna go back and forth with questions. I've randomly selected one of our guessers to start out. So Lena, you get the first choice this evening for your question. 
Excellent. I would love to know what each contestant's favorite invasive species is. Okay, so we'll start out with contestant number one and go right down the row. So mine is Artemisia annua. Hmm. Contestant number two. I'm going to say carp. And contestant number three. I'm going to say scotch broom. Okay, so we have three invasive species provided there. Quite good. Ty, you get question number two. Sure. Uh, so I would love to hear from the panelists. Can you share what you think is one of the most novel solutions to mitigating the impact of a specific invasive species? We'll start out with contestant number one again for this one. Can you repeat the question again? Sorry. Yeah, I am interested in hearing uh, what you think is a novel or interesting way uh, that uh, people have used to mitigate the impact of an invasive species. Hmm. Probably helping out with planning other species to help with the symbiotic pathways. Test number two. I think biocontrols are really interesting. So like one that's kind of a hot topic right now is Phragmites, which kind of grows in ditches around here. It's like a big, tall, pretty grass with tasselly things on top. Um, but they're, they're trying to find a weevil that can kind of drill in there and, and keep it from growing as tall. It's a really big problem like up along Lake Erie and stuff. So, um, you know, maybe once they do enough research, that'll work out. But biocontrols have have had horror stories in the past. So hopefully they do good research before they release it. And contestant number three. Yeah, I'm gonna have to concur and say biocontrols. Um, there's this particular species of microorganism that comes to my mind that creates these like lasso like structures to strangle competitive microorganisms. And uh, yeah. Cool, thank okay. you. Lena, question, next question number three goes to you. All right, in what ways would you say that humans are an invasive species? Ooh. We'll start out with contestant number two for this one. Bring the humans in as the invasive species. Oh, we started with two, I got confused, okay. No, no. Um, yeah, I think that probably the most, you know, important part of being an invasive species, like from a functional perspective of like, why do we care, <laughs> is the impact. So, you know, changing the environment, being a kind of ecosystem engineer, and humans are the number one when it comes to that. Contestant number two, your thoughts on humans as an invasive species? We want more thoughts from you, number two. Give them again. But also one and oh, three at some three. point as well. Thank you. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, I would have to say that every environment we've ever entered, we've kind of altered to fit our, our needs and we've adjusted the habitat um, and, and essentially destroyed habitat for other organisms, which uh, promotes the invasion of other organisms downstream. So um, I would have to say it's humans have uh, served as invasive species in multiple ways. And contestant number one. I'd have to agree with both of those. So I was going to say basically the same thing, but I'm gonna add to that. And I'm gonna also say that the whole biological engineering front has um, kind of enhanced the effects of that as well. Okay, question four goes to you, Ty. Sure, um, so a lot of times you think about uh, invasive species as being uh, a negative thing on the environment, it's introducing some kind of, something that changes the environment. Are there any situations in where an invasive species actually makes a, a positive change on the environment or maybe not one that is so uh, devastating? We'll start out with contestant two again. Um, yeah, so a, a big trend um, 
I think is the, so humans, you know, one of the big ways humans change their environment is by suppressing fire because we need to not have our houses burned down, right? Um, that changes the ecosystem by allowing woody species to take over grasslands. And like a lot of the globe is covered by grasslands. So trees growing in grasslands changes the whole world, but they also capture carbon. Trees hold more carbon than grasses can. So in a climate change era, that is a good ecosystem service. Contestant number three. Oh, yeah, that's a difficult question. I'd say that it's it's very subjective to what your your views of good and bad are with respect to the particular environment. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think if we think about natural invasions, uh, organisms that have some by some chance event crossed a continent into another a continent and then colonized it, that's a I would say maybe a good invasion as it's it's just nature running its course. And contestant number one. I guess maybe this touches on what both of them have just said, but ultimately invasive species could help uh, reduce biodiversity. So biodiversity is only good to an extent. Um, to put it in perspective for people who might not understand, if you think of the deer population in um, say Pennsylvania, we have a lot of them. Um, we have to have hunters go out there and hunt deer. So sometimes it's necessary for these invasive species to be present to knock out kind of those populations of plants that are like overgrowing. Awesome. Thank you. And the last guess or question in this round is going to be from Lena. Great. So I grew up partially in Honolulu, Hawaii, and uh, that's the first where I learned about what an invasive, invasive species is. And that was about mongooses or mongeese, as it were. Uh, so this question is, what can you tell me about uh, why it is that mongoose are often considered sort of like an emblem of Hawaii, but are actually an invasive species and, and don't actually originate? Very detailed question. We're going to start out with contestant three on this one. Can you uh, repeat the very end of your question? Yeah, uh, so the question being, uh, what can you tell me about mongoose and uh, the way that they have come to be seen as like part of Hawaii's habitat, but are actually an invasive species? Yeah, I, I don't know uh, exactly how they're seen as, as part of Hawaii's habitat. Um, I do think it's kind of interesting that you, you bring them up because um, with respect to what we were talking about with biocontrol earlier, we attempted to, I think maybe mongooses were introduced as an attempt to biocontrol a different organism, but they operate at different times of day. So it's an example of biocontrol actually getting out of hand, but I don't know how to, how to describe how they've become a part of Hawaii. Well, if only they had managed to control the cockroach population, it totally would have been worth it. <laughs> Contestant number one, any thoughts on this question? The mongoose of Honolulu. I'm going to be honest, I do not know much about that. Um, but I guess if I were thinking invasive species and trying to help out with a problem, um, isn't there like sugar or something that grows in Hawaii or no? Maybe I'm thinking of like more South, but to be honest, I don't know. I guess it, they might've saw it as something to help with like um, eating another predator of their specific produce they're trying to produce. I, I don't know. Um, and it just so happened that it worked out. I'm sorry, I don't know much about them. <laughs> Contestant number two. Um, I also don't know about this specific case, but if I've learned anything in grad school, it's how to make stuff up. So here's my guess. Um, mong, mong geese, gooses are predators and predators can have a really big impact on the food chain because they are, you know, there's not as many predators as there are the levels below them in the food chain. So just a few of them can have a really big impact on the whole ecosystem. Okay, 
Excellent. And I think we're all still wondering, is it mongoose or mongeese? Maybe it's both. So going to the next two parts of this round, we are going to flash a picture up on the screen. There also will also be a poll coming up. So we're going to ask Ty and Lena to go ahead and take a look at our poll. Try to identify from that list of multiple choice options what this device is that we are showing on the screen. Those at home, this poll is also open to you. So go ahead and feel free to click your choices. And we'll be displaying this poll in just a second. If you are competing for our fabulous t-shirt, now is your chance to earn yourself a point. There are no negative points. So even if you get it wrong, we're not going to count that against you. OK, Karina's behind the scenes here. Karina, you want to show everybody this poll and show us the results we got? OK, so Lena, we'll start with you for this round. What do you think that device is? Are you going to go with uh, the audience or going to go with your own, out on your own? I'm going to have to go with the audience on this one with a portable mass spectrometer. I think that's what it is. And Ty. Yeah, as much as I really want this to be like a really tiny electron microscope or uh, the world's most complicated computer powered stapler where you can really precisely dial in uh, the amount of uh, pressure you want to put on that staple, I'm going to agree with the audience as well on this one. I think that we've got some kind of sensor apparatus here in the front. Uh, so I'm, I think that our audience is quite intelligent and I hope that uh, we're all right together in this one. Okay, so we are going to announce that this is a portable photosynthesis system. So that is the answer, which we had no one answer, I think, did we? Oh, we did. We had three contestants that successfully answered that. Now, if that wasn't challenging enough, our second poll here is, can you figure out how much it would be in order for you, you two to own a portable photosynthesis system at your own home? So here's your second poll. What do you think this fabulous price is if you had to go out and procure it for your laboratory today? We got some big spenders in the room, I see. Sounds like an expensive item. Is there a Ron Popeil version of this? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think we should make a good infomercial about this. Yeah, it should be good for like I would, 11 I would like, I'd time. like to buy one and then get one free. Uh, I also am curious about the shipping and handling fees that are added on top of this when it's when it's delivered. Is it as a sensitive piece of equipment? Uh, now, do you want it? You want two for the price of one, or do you want a complementary portable respiration system to go with your photosynthesis system? Mm, you know, that's great. Uh, as long as one of them slices and the other one dices, uh, and we can get some Julianne, I think that we're probably, I'm, I'm okay with whatever package deal Ron wants to put together. Okay. I suspect that portable respiration system might come as like a small mouse in a box. I just have a bad feeling about that. <laughs> well, okay. if we can find it on Wayfinder, that's the real question. And also, can I use coupons? Uh, because that would be what I would try to do. Okay, about uh, five seconds, lock in your answers if you have not done so yet. Okay, Karina, let's end this poll and show what we've got. Okay, Ty, you get first dibs on this one. What do you think the price of this item is? I think it's priceless. I think priceless. that there's, there's no price that I could put on such an incredible piece of technology that's absolutely so essential that I didn't know existed until this very moment. I think we'll have to add that to the list for the next time we do this game show. And Lena, what are your thoughts? Ty is off the charts with that answer. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna stay on the charts, uh, but I'm gonna say more than my monthly paycheck is the first thing that crossed my mind. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go with the audience answer that corresponds with that, which is 4999 to 7499. Mm. Audience chose right in the middle of this, this zero to $10,000 range, by the way. Okay. Like just splitting splitting this cost. Yeah. So, so those of you that are scoring at home and, and submitting answers here, we have some big spenders in the house. You don't need to spend that price, though, to get this portable photosynthesis system. You only need $2,600. So once again, bottom, rock bottom basement price. 
I think with most people ringing in at, uh, you know, 5,000 to 7,500, it's a steal at twice the price. They should okay. raise the price of this machine, clearly. So for our next thing, we will throw a, a photo up on the screen. Karina, can we get that next photo? We're gonna give each of our, our contestants a minute or 30 seconds to, to, to think about what in the world, why would you need this place to do your invasive species research? We're gonna give them each a second to answer. I'm just gonna call on them one at a time. This has been submitted by our invasive species researcher as a place that is critical for their research. And the other two people are seeing this photo for the first time in their life and have no idea what's its significance. Okay, we'll start with contestant one. Why is this place so important for your research? Um, why is this important for my research? Um, yeah. Because this is in an area where there's actually um, a newly identified invasive species. So it's been contributing to a lot of my current research. What's the That's name all. of that newly identified invasive species that's been contributing to your research? It is actually under patent and I can't disclose that information. Mm. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Contestant number two. Um, so this is a place where there, so this is why, why this location is important. That's the question, right? Yes. Okay. Um, this is the, this is the only habitat where this species grows. So it's not invasive. This is the, the counter example of an invasive species. And contestant three. Uh, this is where an invasive crawdad um, ended up taking hold, where it's out competing the, the smaller uh, species of crawdad that's native to this area. Okay, with that, we have just ended round one. So put our poll up on the screen. We're going to see if you can, at home, can decide who is who. Our invasive species researcher, we have a poll coming up right now. Who is the invasive species researcher in the room? If you've been paying attention at home, there are three there are three contestants we've been playing along with. So decide who you think it is. Um, just to let you know, their photos are up on the screen if you're not really sure who's who. And if you're voting for Ty or Lena, you haven't really been paying. We've attention. somehow invaded invaded this slide. Exactly. Okay. About 10 seconds, and we're going to close this poll out since you only have three options. Pretty straightforward, multiple choice. Okay, Karina, here we go. Guessers, what do you think? Uh, Lena, I think we are okay to start with you. Who do you think the invasive species researcher is? You know, I'm leaning pretty strongly towards contestant two. Uh, and part of that is that if there's anything I learned in grad school, it's how to nod along and pretend you understand everything that's happening while people talk about their uh, subject matter research. But contestant two sounded sounded pretty confident uh, in their answers, and I find, found myself nodding a lot. And Ty, where are you? Yes. Uh, so I'm stuck somewhere between contestant two and contestant three on this. Uh, I did cast my vote for contestant two, and I think what pushed me over the edge on this was the very specific answer on uh, the uh, biocontrols uh, related to um, the uh, weevils and the very specific type of grass that was mentioned. That was either an incredibly excellent uh, BS answer or uh, given by somebody who is very passionate about something. And I, I'm not sure which at this point. I mean, on the other hand, contestant three was twirling a mustache. So that seems pretty, pretty telling as well. I know contestant one also has that patent pending brand new species. So I'm, you know, I want to learn more about that. Okay, interesting. Well. We are uh, keeping score of everybody's points if you're at home. And we have a, a score here who's actually taking care of that. So we are now in round two. We're now in pharmacology. So we are trying to figure out who the pharmacologist is in this round. The pharmacologist has to be honest, and the other two are just making stuff up. 
So here we go, next round. Uh, so we will start with you, Lena. You get the first question this next round. Absolutely. So I imagine that not many kids like grow up thinking I want to study pharmacology. So can you go ahead and tell us what it is that got you interested in this field and starting to pursue it? So we'll start out with contestant two. Yeah, so uh, growing up, I always loved math and science classes, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. So when I got to college, I took, you know, all kinds of different prerequisites and I, chemistry is what I really fell in love with. And um, I did some undergrad research in a lab and got more exposed to the field and decided I wanted to keep going on in, in grad school in the field. Contestant three. I just became honestly pretty fascinated with how small chemical molecules can completely uh, change for your perspective or, you know, fight disease or just how chemistry can uh, interact with our neurological and, and physiological ecosystem in our own body. And contestant one. So my family's had their fair share of kind of like genetic diseases that aren't too nice and to be honest ever since I was little and learned about them I always knew that when I grew up I wanted to change that I wanted to come up with a cure for something or come up with a drug that would alter the outlook for those disease states so okay Ty what next question goes to you I'm so excited for this round I know you've been looking at me this whole thing being like, this dude absolutely loves drugs and is super excited to ask questions about drugs. And you're right. I wake up every morning and I do drugs every morning, uh, starting with my favorite drug, caffeine. Uh, it's incredible. I love it. I suggest all of you use it. But not all drugs are as awesome as caffeine is. Uh, some are very dangerous. Uh, so I would like each of the contestants to tell me what they think is the most dangerous legal drug in the world and why. We'll start with contestant two again. Well, I think I'm gonna to have to go with alcohol. I think the statistics are on that side, right? In terms of fatalities and, and things like that. Contestant three. Yeah, just by sheer magnitude, it's it's gotta be alcohol hands down. Um, and then there's also all these research chemicals that come out onto the market that are quasi legal chemicals that end up in these uh, <laughs> uh, fishy stores that people can buy, like bath salt sticks out to me as one of the more harmful legal chemicals of recent history. And contestant number one. I would have to say any compound or drug that has a specific pathogen that has developed resistance to it, specifically those drugs um, that have now generated superbugs because it's only a matter of time before they really become a threat. They already have, but it's getting worse. Can you give me an example of one of those drugs? Um, so antibiotics, I'll just say in general. You probably know some of them. If you'd like me to elaborate, I can, but I'm gonna say antibiotics, final answer. No, I think that clears it up for everyone where we're going with that, thank you. Very different perspectives on the answers there. Lena, next question goes to you. Excellent. So as, th as someone with lots of mental health issues, uh, <laughs> one of the things that I've learned through live experience about pharmacology is how it takes a lot of effort to find the right drugs for you personally, um, particularly in regards to depression, which I have uh, clinical chronic depression. So my question is, uh, why is it if human bodies are mostly the same, uh, how would you explain to a lay audience why it takes so much time and effort to find the right drug or drug combination for something that is actually extremely common in the human population, such as depression? We'll start out with contestant number three. I would just have to say that we try to categorize diseases into these hard and fast categories, but the, the way they manifest physiologically is complex. And so you know, what depression is for, for one person may be completely different 
physiologically for, for another person. And um, maybe it's related to serotonin in one person, or maybe it's related to dopamine in the other person. Contestant number one. I completely agree with contestant three's answer. Um, I'll just add to that and say that everybody's body is different. Um, your genetic makeup is different. Uh, you have various receptors that interact with these drugs that are given. So for some people taking a drug, it might um, affect someone in some way and then another in another way. Uh, for example, like even myself, I've tried different things for mental health. Some have made me gain weight, whereas other people have said it doesn't make them gain weight. So I think it has a lot to do with genetic makeup and also how your body just reacts to them. But I was going to say the same thing as contestant three. So hopefully that helps a little more with that. Contestant two. Yeah, and just to add to that, I guess I'm thinking about like how these things are studied in clinical trials and the fact that, you know, you have this population of people you're studying and there are a million things that you just can't control for, like the, you know, differences in diets and environments and genetics and, and everything like that. So then, you know, the outcome, this, you know, drug that goes on the market, uh, it, there's probably still a lot that you don't know about it when, when you um, get to that end product. Okay, we have uh, two more in this round. Ty, I think you're next. Yeah, so there are lots and lots of different types of drugs uh, that do lots and lots of different things and are designed for different purposes. Uh, so as you're doing your research, what class of drug interests you the most and why do you think it is the most interesting? Start out with contestant three again. Uh, I would have to say the ergot alkaloids, just because of um, their uh, class of chemicals produced by a living organism that's a, a pathogen of plants. And they're interesting because they have implications in the Salem witch trials historically and um, things like that, uh, just historical precedents that sort of make them fascinating. But then also we've, we've gone on to modify those structures to make different um, chemicals that actually can be prescribed as pharmaceuticals. That's number one. I'm gonna to have to go with novel bacterial tolvoisomerase inhibitors, NBTIs. They're the new up and coming antibiotic. Okay, keep that in mind, everybody. Investment opportunities there. Contestant number two. Um, I'm gonna to have to go with hallucinogenics. Okay, the last We'll skip the why part on that, I guess, too. That's fine. I think we all know the answers. Okay, Lena, you get the last question in this series. Excellent. Uh, I just can't stop thinking about how uh, MBTIs might be the next investment opportunity. But personally, I'm looking to go marry Bill Gates. Um, I will totally uh, go back to being straight for that uh, and invest in that. But, uh, <laughs> to get back on track. Uh, in terms of investing, uh, what would you say is the biggest sort of uh, investment that you have made in your education pursuing pharmacology specifically? Um, and what is unique to pharmacology in that terms of investment? Like what is the experience like studying pharmacology that requires various like mental energy that may be from some of these other fields? We're going to start out with contestant number one for this. Okay, so to repeat that, you're saying what's the biggest investment I've made that's basically benefited me the most? Yeah, if I heard exactly. It correctly. Yeah, and if, if that's in any way different from any other fields of studies. So I would have to say the biggest investment I've made is um, staying open-minded and keeping myself diverse in the field of research, uh, incorporating my studies um, hands-on and in the books in both uh, biological sciences and more so the chemistry side of things. That's number two. Um, yeah, I think that uh, similarly, uh, just like collaborating with different people and sort of like 
the multidisciplinary aspect I didn't really expect, but it's been, it's been a, you know, it's been a, a, a big investment in like a lot of, um, I don't know, more like interpersonal type connections that I, I maybe wouldn't have thought would be as big of a part of the research process, but has, has that huge payout and import in the field. And contestant number three. I'm going to have to uh, agree with contestant one as well. I think that, uh, you know, maybe there's a perception that in these quantitative fields that are like hard science, like pharmacology, you can't be uh, thrown around with your own bias. But sometimes even when I'm looking at uh, analytical uh, results, I can still sometimes find my mind getting fixated on a particular solution to a problem, even though it's, it's, it's actually my own bias manifesting. Um, so I'd say that, yeah, I've made a significant investment in trying to open my mind to uh, diverse um, uh, research and, and, and keeping my own mind open during the, during the research process. Okay. Talking about keeping our minds open, we will throw a picture up on the screen. So this is submitted by our pharmacologist. There will be a poll also appear, and you have to figure out what in the heck this piece of equipment with all the tubes coming out of it is used for. Once again, multiple choice questions. So you don't have to come up with your own. What is this expensive device for? It's got some glassware there. Lena and Ty, think about what your answers are gonna be. We will show you the audience thoughts before you have to answer. Okay, Karina, let's see what we have from the audience. That's what we have. I think we went with Ty first last time, so Lena will give you the first choice at this. What do you think this thing's for? You know, I'm thinking maybe a centrifuge. This looks slightly similar to what they use for the Your Plan for Health uh, annual checkups at Ohio State, where you can <laughs> earn money towards your health care because late capitalism is a joy. Uh, so I'm going to guess centrifuge. Okay. And Ty, your thoughts? Yeah. So um, my guess is that this would make a pretty poor dehumidifier as whatever liquid seems to be in there seems exposed. Uh, it could be the essential oil distiller. Uh, that seems like a very pro-grade model though, and definitely something different than uh, we make at, uh, at L Brands where I'm employed. Uh, but I, I, I'm gonna go with centrifuge as well. I think the vials there on top maybe are what is making me lean towards that. Uh, in this answer, but I am excited to learn what this machine actually is. Okay. So this device is a hydrogen generator. That is its purpose. I know it sounds like Mr. Fusion from Back to the Future. Um, so we are gonna ask people to uh, put their costs down. So that poll is coming up right now. How much did this wonderful hydrogen generator cost if you too wanted to own one at home? And then we can see as Ty was asking if Ronco happens to provide this beautiful device. You know, instead of saying that folks are full of hot air, uh, I'm gonna start calling them a, a hydrogen generator. So when, particularly when faculty at conferences say, it's not really a question so much as a statement, hydrogen generator. Now, is that methane generator? Is that more accurate, though? Probably. <laughs> it is more of a greenhouse gas, though, so it would be a little more lethal. OK, Karina, let's see. We show the audience what we got here. Ty, or Lena, we'll start with you. Cost? I'm going to have to go with the audience consensus here, uh, both because of lack of expertise and mm -hmm. uh, because that seems like a, a reasonable price for something like this. Ty? Yeah, I mean, if we're playing by prices right rules, I am going to outbid Lena by a dollar on this and uh, and bid up, uh, notably because this is healthcare related and we're in America. So I'm sure it costs way more than it actually should uh, for something that looks like it's put together with rubber tubing. I can get it Lowe's and a, a box whose tolerance is not quite there as it doesn't actually fit snugly around the case. 
Uh, so um, yeah, probably too much. Okay, I, I think our previous experience biased everybody. Everybody went high last time and they went low this time. This one's gonna set you back $4,900, a little more expensive. Thank you very much. Moving on to round three, our last round. So we went from invasive species to pharmacology, and now we are going to mycology. Remember those of you that did not study Latin, this is fungi. So with this, we're gonna go ahead and start our question again. Lena, you have the first question on this round, and we'll start out by, with contestant number three. So Lena, what question do you wanna ask? What is the worst dad joke or pun that you have heard about your field in that you study fun guy? Oh, it's, it's gotta be, so you're a fun guy, hands down. Contestant number one. That's literally the only one I know, so that one. <laughs> Contestant number two. I don't know, I was running through all the like obscure fungal words, but I, I can't think of anything else top of my head, you know? The, the fun guy, that's the go-to. As a former high school teacher, I definitely agree with that. Okay, going on to Ty, next question. As much as I wanna ask number three if they know another bad fungi joke, because I suspect that they might. Um, I'm gonna ask this question. So we're leaving, uh, I spent a lot of time in Athens, Ohio. And so I know that this time of year, we're, we're leaving moral season right now. And uh, those mushrooms are, are very good mushrooms, uh, but they're not uh, something that you can often find in the store. Uh, and if you do special order them, they're quite expensive, like up to $30 a pound. Uh, so can you speak on why some mushrooms like morals are so difficult to cultivate and why they cost so much more than the uh, $1.99 pack of white mushrooms I get from Kroger every week? Oh, contestant number three, I was forgetting my job. <laughs> um, yeah, so those, some of those mushrooms, like the white ones that you buy from the store, those are like saprophytic, so they'll just grow on undecaying material and you can kind of throw anything at them and they'll just eat it. But then you have like uh, morels, and I, I don't know if I think it's for this case, but morels and maybe chanterelles, other species of mushrooms that are actually symbiotic and they require um, their host organism. Uh, they require this relationship with another organism to grow. And that's like extremely difficult to establish outside of uh, the natural environment. That's number one. Um. I guess I would answer that from um, more of a business perspective. I think it's more cost effective to sell some of the mushrooms that are easier to grow and specifically like generate in house instead of just going out in the land and growing them and cultivating them. So I think that's why you don't see those um, sold and grown at the prices that they usually are. That's number two. Um, yeah, to add to all that, um, so the so different species have different like ways of obtaining nutrients, like contestant three was talking about. Um, some of them are decomposers, some of them are symbiotic with other plants or other things, but then like some some of them can be like on a continuum, and it depends on the conditions uh, that they find themselves in, which end that they go towards. Um, so like if it's a more moist environment or um, a warmer environment, things like that can kind of flip the scale. So, um, you know, how do you, how do you control all of that? How do you figure all those little variables out for all these different species that we might be interested in? Um, so that's why, you know, foraging for them or waiting for the right season to go find them. Um, it just makes it more fun. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Narrowing down to the last three questions, Lena, you get the next question to contestant number one. So something that we have been seeing in the last couple of years is this sort of like repopularization of foraging, particularly for things like truffles and mushrooms. Um, I'm interested, uh, how would you explain to a lay person uh, what the history is there, especially since that's primarily been something indigenous peoples have continued doing um, culturally in the last few hundred years and not so much something that white folks and, and colonizers have been doing. 
Um, so what are sort of those, those social implications of, you know, you study scientifically, uh, but what do you see the social implications of this kind of thing getting more popular? Guess number one. I have no idea how to answer that. I just know that I like truffle fries with some Parmesan cheese on top. So that's my answer. <laughs> right there with you. I'm, I'm with you. That's a great answer. Contestant two. Um, well, it seems like a great opportunity to like tap into some of that traditional ecological knowledge from indigenous people. So that's that's a really cool like education opportunity, I think. Um, but you know, there's also safety concerns, I would say, are a big societal thing um, to make sure that people are educated mm -hmm. and know how to identify or have like a good source to double check their identifications. And contestant three. Yeah, I would say um, there's sort of a, a rich history of mushroom picking in all cultures across the world, I would say, even even out in places like Northern Europe. Um, I would say recently where it's kind of gotten bigger in the US is definitely recently, but also with respect to uh, psychoactive mushrooms, which have garnered some recent respect in our cultures for their ability to potentially treat depression. But um, that's been historically known by indigenous peoples across, across North and South America for centuries, for thousands of years. <laughs> Okay, Ty, next question goes to you. Sure. Um, so, you know, when we think about mycology, we think about mushrooms, I think most often, I mean, that was the graphic that was even used in this show, but I, I think that there's a lot of other ways that uh, the fungi and mycology impacts people's lives. So can you, can you share one way that, that people might interact with fungi or it might in, impact their lives and, and mycology might touch somebody's everyday life uh, that they might not know or they might not expect. We'll start out with contestant number two. Yeah, so I, we, we think of mushrooms, which are just like the fruiting body, but really um, for most of their lives, they're, they're microbes. Um, so like the study of mycology is, is studying microbes. And I mean, there, there are lots of I guess connections, but but one example would be like crop pathogens. So a lot of those are um, they are fungi, and they can have really big, important uh, you know impacts on our food systems. That's number three. I would say um, historically. Uh, uh, when, when plants developed like woody textures like lignin, um, there was nothing out there that could decompose it. And then fungi uh, eventually evolved the ability to decompose lignin. And there was just this tremendous uh, increase in, in carbon dioxide in this atmosphere because fungi were finally able to tap into this, to this uh, chemical structure that no other organism could decompose. So um, for, for thousands to, thousands of years, there were just logs stacking on top of each other until fungi developed the ability to decompose them. So that's a pretty crazy magnitude to put it in perspective. Contestant okay, number one. And I'm just gonna keep it simple with a lot of people hike or garden or do outdoor things in general. And I guess um, specifically for gardening, it can help with the process of your plants growing or not growing. For hiking, um, when you take your kids out for a hike, you can teach them about different things, just morphology, um, where they're growing, why they're growing. So I think if you're trying to relate to the everyday person, those are two aspects of the environment you can teach with mycology. Awesome, thanks. And our last question of this evening goes to Lena. We have to keep our contestants to one sentence responses though. All right, uh, what is the weirdest looking fungi you have personally seen and what did it look like? And we'll start out with contestant number two. A stinkhorn, which was pink with an olive green and of like gooey, sticky, smelly stuff. That's number three. I'm gonna have to say the pink mold that grew on my ceiling in my previous apartment. 
No campus housing. <laughs> yeah. Test number one. And I'm going to say the black mold that grew in my shower. Yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. Okay, going on to the photo round. I'd like to go ahead and uh, throw up our photo and our poll. We have uh, something submitted by the mycologist. This is a device. We have a multiple choice question with the same options coming up. So I'd like you to go ahead and take a second and decide what you think this device is for. Okay, about 10 seconds on this poll and we're gonna close it down to make your vote. Ty and Lena will go ahead and put this up on the screen before you respond. Okay, Karina, let's see what people have for their answers. Okay, so that's what our audience says. Ty, what do you think this device is for? Yeah, I I think that this we, we clearly looks like we've got a USB-C port here. So maybe this is for a very fast transfers of files and it's for a very expensive USB drive. But I think I'm going to go uh, that this is a uh, portable mass spectrometer. I'm not sure that a DNA scanner exists quite in this size. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to side with at least 36% of the audience on this one. I would like to give a call to the person who did answer computer powered stapler because Karina on our team will be super excited. That was one of our excellent distractors that just wanted to throw that out. Lena, what do you think? Sorry if you're going to go for the stapler. Uh, yeah, away. you just gave it away. Now I got to choose something different. Uh, I'm going to say the portable mass spectrometer just because I have never gotten to say that word aloud other than recapping like NCIS episodes. So we go with that one. Okay, uh, this device, I guess mass spectrometers haven't quite shrunk to this side. This is actually a DNA scanner, but it is a DNA and RNA scanner. It actually does both. So here you go, two for the price of one, as we were talking about earlier. We're going to put the poll up for price of this device. How much do you think this one costs? Portable DNA scanner can plug into your USB on your computer. Last vote of the evening besides the last two matches for our researchers. So this is your last two, three chances to get some points if you're wanting that wonderful t-shirt taken out of one of our closets in our office. I'm just excited those t-shirts are coming out of the closet. Like I feel that deeply and it can be really transformative. So y'all are in for a treat. Authentic. Okay, well, let's put it up on the screen. Lena, you get to... Uh, Give your number first. What are you going to go for? I'm going to say 10 grand or more because DNA scanner seems pretty intimidating to me personally. Um, yeah, I'm thinking the more the merrier on the dollar amount. I mean, this is just like the tricorder of a Star Trek. I totally know what that is as well. Awesome. Glad to have uh, another Trekkie on this show. <laughs> and Ty, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that I'm going to go with this being under $1,000. I think this may be one of those uh, give away the razor, sell the blades kind of scenarios, right, with this. Uh, you know, as a, as a software developer, uh, I like to think that the software is where the hard part in the computation and where the cost is really going to come with this. So if it's just for the hardware alone, I'm going to say under $1,000. Okay. Well, you know what? I think this is definitely the steal of the evening. You can get this for a whopping $3,300, which seems like a lot of money, but you know, DNA scanner, imagine that 20 years ago. Jurassic Park, when I was in high school, like this is amazing, that's a great deal. Okay, well, we're gonna put our, our last two polls up. We wanna know who you think the mycologist in the room is. So we're gonna ask Lena and Ty to explain who they think the matches are. So Karina, put up those that last poll, who is the mycologist amongst our three contestants? Uh, for those of you that are just joining this show, we've added two additional people you can vote on. If you vote on those people, I can guarantee you are not going to get a point here. I will give you, I will give you, I'm going to give you 200 points if you vote for me. Ooh, um, you just th those are, those are personal points, tie points. I don't know that what their transfer rate is in exchange rate is for this game, but uh, for me, uh, you know, for my ego, uh, there, uh, the boost is it's again, it's priceless. It's such a deal. Okay. We'll put those up on the screen, Karina. Uh, Lena, we're going to let you start out. Who do you think the mycologist in the group is? 
I'm leaning toward contestant number three. There were some pretty detailed answers there. A little hesitant because while hilarious, the, uh, the mold comment was not as specific as contestant number two. Mm. So I'm waffling a bit, uh, just like I did with my gender identity for several years. And Ty, what are your thoughts? I feel pretty certain about this one. Uh, I believe that contestant number three is the mycologist in this one. Uh, there were a lot of very uh, detailed answers in the question round, but they also made a very specific reference in round two uh, to ergot. Uh, so I think I'm uh, that might have given them away a little early. Okay. Hey. And let's put up the uh, pharmacologist because I, in my amateur role, failed to actually put that poll up. So we'll put that up right now because maybe people's thoughts have waffled since the first round. So which one is the pharmacologist? Ty, you can't lobby for yourself. Lena, you can't lobby for yourself because you're not on this poll. Okay, let's show the poll, Karina. Ty, we'll give you first chance to respond here. Yeah, I think the audience nailed this one. I think it's the number one is, is absolutely the pharmacologist in this group. Uh, I think particularly telling to me was the answer on the uh, most dangerous legal drug. Um, contestants two and three took that in a very societal approach with alcohol, uh, but number one took it into a sense of a legal drug as a, like an FDA regulated drug and uh, antibiotics. And they also, when talking about advances in, in technology, dropped uh, a, a very specific reference to a new field of antibiotics that was either some incredibly quick made up scientific jargon uh, that fooled me or is showing some deep knowledge in, of, of their research field. So contestant number one. Lena. Gonna have to concur with contestant one. Yeah, that drop of NBTI, which I've already forgotten what that was supposed to stand for, was uh, pretty impressive. Also, not gonna lie, it might have been a little bit uh, biased by the photos with contestant one being in a photo and what looks like it could be a white coat. I saw that. I saw that as well. I was trying to put that out of my mind, but that absolutely looks like something that would be on the wall at the med center uh, at OSU. So. It could be a farm. Uh, that could be, it could be a red herring. That could be a red herring. Could have been planted there from the beginning to skew this whole thing. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's the case. Okay, so we're going to allow our contestants, our guessers off the hook. We're going to let our contestants introduce themselves so we can see who they are. We will start out with contestant one in order. Introduce yourself, what your name is, what field you study, and give us a sentence or two about what in the world you do. Okay, so I already said I'm Chelsea, but um, I'm a medicinal chemist. Uh, my field of study is focused on making molecules for the purpose of treating diseases. And the lab that I work in is interested in developing compounds to combat the issue of antibiotic resistance. So ult ultimately, we'd like to uh, generate a drug that could help patients with the multi-drug resistant bacterial infections. But if we could find out information about these superbugs along the way, that would also be great. Contestant number two, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Hi, um, I'm Callie Mattingly. I, uh, I love plants. Um, I want to know why they grow where they grow. And to do that, I study invasive plants and rare plants, plants that grow everywhere and plants that grow nowhere. And so I, I'm kind of broadly interested in their evolutionary ecology. So like why they're growing where they grow and then like adapt, ad, potential adaptive explanations for why that might be based on their genetics or their traits. Um, so I've studied um, a, a bunch of different species, uh, but all plants, they're super cute and I love them. And this does involve repelling off cliffs, if I remember from one of our previous conversations. It does, yeah. So that um, the picture of the lake, that was my lake, Seneca Lake, which is a finger lake in upstate New York, which has cliffs along it where a, um, an endangered plant grows that I studied for my master's. It's called Leedy's Roseroot. It's a little succulent, very adorable. You can look it up on the internet. And contestant number three. Hi, I'm Zach Conkle. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist that uh, specifically focuses on, on fungi. Um, and I'm actually 
I don't spend much of my time interacting with the organisms at all. I, I actually develop software um, and study the genomes of, of fungi. So I, I do a lot of software development to analyze genomic data. Um, and, and basically, I, I pay attention to um, the regions of the genomes that produce uh, drug candidates. That, that um, So fungi actually produce a lot of pharmaceuticals or inspirations for pharmaceuticals. And there's particular ways we can look at the genome to try to identify uh, regions that might produce these chemicals. So um, yeah, I, I basically spend a lot of time developing software to analyze fungal genomes. Excellent. Well, I know we are running over our time. This was designed to be an eight o'clock to nine o'clock program. We appreciate everybody tuning in and sticking with us the entire duration. Um, I do need to give some thanks before we close out this evening. Ty and Lena for being our guinea pigs. We actually never got a chance to try that format. So they took a real risk joining us this evening with some excellent questions to get out the details of what all these people are researching. Um, Kelly, Chelsea, Zach, thank you very much for signing up. You, you did a practice run with us. Thanks for sharing your research. Thanks for taking the opportunity to be vulnerable to go out on a limb and lie for us about research. You have no idea what it is. I, I would say almost all the answers were extremely compelling though. Yeah, you guys did really great jobs at at BSing. Uh, if you ever want to want to shift into a career in science education, you you definitely got the gift of gab and spitting on your feet. So uh, you're you're all out there doing a great job of trying to fool us. Yeah, I feel like I learned a lot, and I'm just not 100 percent sure what all was true or not. So <laughs> but I learned many things. So be careful using this information tomorrow at a high powered meeting at work. The, um, I would, we might have a score coming up to know if Lena or Ty officially won this. Uh, I, that might be coming in. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to give thanks to Joe, Shelley, and Krista for being our closed captioners and ASL translators this evening. Also would like to uh, give a big shout out to our team behind the scenes, many of whom you did not see. Karina Pegau, Courtney Price, Catherine O'Brien, Cynthia Kanan, Monica Delgado Carrillo, and Wayne Schlingman. I'm Jason Servanek. I work at the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center on campus, but this team is part of the West Fest Collaborative, a number of research centers across campus that are trying to share our research with the broader public. Uh, wow. So we have t-shirts going out to some fabulous person. We'll figure that out tomorrow. Lena and Ty, you tied. That's a tie means I win, right? That's my name. Oh. We tied. So, well, you, so you both get bragging rights in the wonderful trophy that we have yet to purchase. Great. I'm very much looking forward and to ten. adding your voice to my voicemail. Uh, so uh, I'll send you that text for the pre-recorded message as soon as this is over. Lena, do you use voicemail? I don't know how you use voicemail, but that's pretty old school. I don't know uh, you know, I'm a millennial, so I don't talk on the phone very often. Look, I'm not going to listen to them. I just want Jason to tell everyone that if you leave a message, I will not listen to it. <laughs> and uh, you should text me instead. Well, good night, everyone. And hopefully, if you too made a pretzel earlier in your own oven from your own freezer, soft pretzel, you can go eat that snack right now. Served in your kitchen at your convenience. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>